So today we are looking at a standard 500 gallon per day aerobic septic system, pump replacement, and getting the wiring correct. Uh, this thing has been sitting for a year or so without use. So we are getting everything fixed and we're gonna show you the wiring so that you don't have any doubt on what you're supposed to be doing and what connects to what. All right, so let's talk about pumps. This is the old pump. It's a 20 EB0521J. This is what's replacing it. It's a 20 gallon per minute, which matches the 20 gallon per minute of that one. It's half horsepower and it's 115 volt. You're just going to be matching whatever the pump is that's coming out. That's what's gonna be going back in. So you're gonna pull your pump out and look at it. You can Google whatever your model number is and find out exactly what its specs are and then buy a similar pump get something that's gonna last. Anyways, they just unscrew from the top, whatever your threaded size may be, um, and then the new one screws on. So it's a very simple replacement. You don't have to use PTFE tape or anything on the threads. Um, it's not gonna hurt if there's a little bit of water seepage here, because again, this is all gonna be underwater, but you're gonna wanna make sure that you don't cross thread it and you get everything seated well in there. This system has two floats. It has the regular float that goes up and down, tells the pump when to turn off, and then it has the alarm float. Um, they have to be rated for a certain amount of voltage. You can see when it turns on, when it turns off, the voltage. One of the problems with this pump is that they had the alarm float right here taped at this, at this position tight so it could never turn off because how these pumps work is when the float goes up it tells it to turn on when the float goes down it tells it to turn off the alarm is meant to be up here this is where the water level should ideally never get to once it gets to this the the incoming pipe is right here once it gets up to this height then the alarm should sh sound to say this pump is not working so the alarm pump goes up here, or float goes up here, then the other float, which was just floating around in the tank, which means it pretty much would never turn off, and that's probably why this burned out. So that needs to be taped, or zip tied, rather, up here. It should have about four to six inches of lead so that it can turn on and turn off. And it should be about in this position. So it's not gonna hit with the other one that's up here and it's not gonna hit down here. It won't get tangled in anything. You want to turn on and turn off. And that amount of water is good for the pump to keep running so it doesn't get burned up. So here's the control panel. You've got the compressor, which is down here and it's bubbling air all the way out there. And then there's another line coming from over here, which is the pump circuit and the alarm circuit. You'll have two hots, a neutral, and a ground. Uh, you might have more, but that's that's where you've got to start figuring stuff out. Okay, guys, so this is really the whole wiring schematic of everything that's down in that hole. So I'm going to go over it really quickly. It's not super difficult. All right, so we've got four conductors coming plus a ground into our box. We've got a neutral, a return line for the alarm pump, float, uh, the pump, and then the alarm power itself. So how this works is you're gonna have your neutral and your ground and they're gonna be directly connected to your pump. Nothing else gets connected to them. So neutral, ground, direct to the pump. Then the pump itself is being connected to the pump float. So the pump circuit takes power out. It goes through the pump float because it's just a switch. Power flows through when that thing turns on. It sends power via its neutral line over to the pump itself. So the neutral from the pump float gets connected to the hot conductor of the pump. Then that completes the circuit and you've got sprinklers going. Then the alarm float over there, alarm sends power out, it connects to the hot conductor of the alarm float. Then when it turns on because your cesspool is overflowing for whatever reason, then it sends power back via its neutral line all the way back via the return conductor to the control panel, little woo-woo lights go off, you get an alarm. So that is the basics of how all of this gets set up. It's not super complicated, but you've got to isolate everything and know 
what is going to what so you're not just wiring things in random down there. The return conductor is just kind of the last man standing. If you've got just a red or black conductor that's in your box and you're like, I don't know what that is, it's probably for your alarm float to connect to to send power back. And you can verify that by looking in your control panel and you'll see what color line is connected to the second spot of the alarm circuit. Here it is. So this one where the two blue wires are, that's what's taking power out. When it goes through the alarm, it comes back to this one, which brings power over to the alarm. So this is what it looks like afterwards with these specialty waterproof connectors. They just have silicone or whatever inside. And so everything's wired up. I have the caps facing up so that if water does get into this box, you know, when it dries out, the water will not pool in the bottom of the cap. You want the alarm switch to be right below where that inlet port is so that by the time it gets to the current level of what this tank is, that alarm's going off. And then you want your float switch so it's going to turn off at about this level and it's turning on at about this level. So you want enough slack for it to turn on, then turn off. Okay, you don't want the water to get so low that this intake port is running dry. So do not let your float just flop around. Don't put on two feet of it so it turns off way down here. And then your alarm float is gonna go up here in this area so that when it gets that high, your alarm is going off. And this is what connects, it's got a union and you can adjust how much pressure is being sent out to your sprinkler lines. Typically you let some water flow back into your tank here. Okay, so I've got the uh, the float switch zip tied to the pump. I've got a few zip ties on it. And now we're gonna test it out. So when this goes up, that pump should turn on. So the pump is dropped down in there. The union is reattached. The ball valve handles just snapped off because they're just old and corroded. Uh, so I had to use some pliers to turn it back on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on the pump. I'm going to let it run. There is some debris down in here currently, some grass. I'm gonna get my vacuum and suck that out because I don't want that going into the pump. Uh, and then as the water drops, I'm going to watch. I'm gonna watch where the pump is and then I'm gonna zip tie my lines up here to the top right here so they don't get tangled with the pump float, okay? Because if that float gets tangled in these lines and doesn't turn off or doesn't turn on, we're gonna have problems. So I need to make sure none of my lines are gonna get messed up and tangled with that float switch ever. Yeah, I wanna be putting that in my mouth. Again, right now we're waiting to make sure that the float switch is gonna turn off in its current spot. And then I'm gonna zip tie these lines to the top of the post here. But this ball valve that's down in there that's spraying water is adjusted so that the PSI that's reaching the sprinkler heads is about 40 PSI. And you see where the float is. You can see that my lines over there are out of the way. So I've got the float there now. It's uh, below the uh, inlet port that will turn on about where the inlet port comes in. So everything's hunky-dory now. All out of the way. I also, this lid had been sitting there, it was covered in mud and ants, so I cleaned it all. This is nice and clean. So this is going back down, right like so. And then a nice clean lid can go back into its position and be ready to go again. So hopefully this is helpful if you have a two float system. And uh, if you've got any questions, leave it in the comments. All right guys, I will see you in the next video.